Written and directed by Guillermo del Toro, Mimic is the filmmaker's first sci-fi horror film made for Western audiences. While most movie fans are now familiar with his work on later films like Hellboy 1 and 2, Pan's Labyrinth, Pacific Rim and The Shape of Water, most of which we've already covered, links in the description, Mimic helped put this inventive creator on the map. It's essentially a cautionary tale about meddling with nature, one delivered through the ominous Judas breed, a bioengineered hybrid race of insects that begin to prey on humans. You said the ones we released only had a lifespan of six months. We engineered them to be sterile adults. The Judases were not supposed to last past one generation. They were designed to die. They are breeding. The film follows the outbreak of a fictional illness known as Strickler's disease in New York City. Carried by the city's population of cockroaches, Strickler began infecting hundreds of children in the Manhattan area. With the disease spiraling out of control, the CDC deputy director, Dr. Peter Mann, enlists the help of entomologist Dr. Susan Tyler to create a biological counteragent that will eradicate all traces of the disease. This results in the creation of the Judas breed, a genetically engineered chimera of termites and mantises that are released into the sewers and effectively eradicated the city's cockroach population, ending the epidemic. We recombine termite and mantid DNA, a new species to be our six-legged ally in wiping out the roach population. We call it the Judas breed. When creating the Judas breed, Tyler and her colleagues instituted several fail-safes to ensure they had a limited lifespan, including the design of a suicide gene that would cause the cells to disintegrate via apoptosis. In this starting stage, the creatures were slightly larger than the average insect and contained six legs and a small set of wings. Unfortunately, the rapid rate of metabolism programmed into the insects had an adverse effect, sparking generations of evolution in just three years. After their initial release, the species underwent thousands of mutations, with the most beneficial being passed down to later generations. During this immense evolutionary boom, organs became fully formed, including a new set of lungs which allowed them to grow in size, and the suicide gene disappeared from their gene pool completely, enabling them to breed. New generations of the creatures were born via Uthika, a large sac that contains dozens of eggs. While normally the size of a small bean, the Judas breed egg sacs are significantly larger. At the moment of birth, infants are approximately 7 inches long, but over the course of a shortened aging period, they grow to approximately 10 feet. Using their back two set of legs, the adults walk upright, leaving their front two legs to serve as grasping and offensive appendages. Draping their long wings over their abdomens, they are able to take on a cloaked appearance. To complete their mimicry, they have two shell-like protrusions on their front limbs, which combine to create a human-like mask. I remember Remy says to me, if it's got more than four legs, it's not a mammal. It's a lobster. This thing is not just some random mutation. It's a highly evolved, soldier-cast, formidable killer. Aided by their substantial size, the Judas breed can easily overwhelm their enemy before using their sharpened legs to stab and dismember them. And as a highly territorial species, they rarely appear above ground, instead choosing to lurk in the vast subway and sewer systems beneath the city. When they do decide to venture topside, they are almost always shrouded in their human disguise, appearing as tall men in overcoats. Similar to specific species of mantis, as well as other insects such as moths and caterpillars, they use this organic camouflage to deceive their foe. While their mimicry is far from perfect, they tend to stick to shadowy, half-lit areas, making their true form hard to discern. And although they occasionally kill their prey when threatened, they are more likely to incapacitate them, then drag them into a holding area to be eaten later. Despite their exceptional strength and navigational prowess, they are actually far more likely to stalk weakened prey rather than risk injury against multiple enemies in traditional combat. Capable of speedy flight, the bugs can whisk away any fleeing prey with ease, and to communicate with their peers, they clink their mandibles together, emitting a subdued but identifiable pattern of clicks. In addition to this auditory process of communication, the insects also use smell to identify between friend and foe. This sense of smell is shark-like, enabling them to track human blood from miles away, and this tremendous dependency is actually later exploited by the team, who rub an excised scent gland over their bodies to mask themselves. Despite their terrifying size and ability to swiftly deal out death, these intimidating insects have traditional weaknesses, making them far less durable than expected. In their infancy and adolescent stages, the Judas breed can be eliminated with a quick stomp. Even once they've grown to their full disgusting size, their bodies have lackluster shielding. Blunt or bladed weapons, guns and fire are all brilliant avenues of attack. However, they are remarkably resilient and will continue fighting until they've been completely destroyed. What the hell's going on around here? Ah! 
With half of their DNA attributed to termites, it's no surprise that the Judas breed exists within a basic caste system, protecting their sole breeder with a legion of soldiers. Unlike termites though, there's no worker caste to forage for supplies or create nests, as the New York subways exist as a perfect damp and dark environment to prosper in. With over 840 miles of subway tunnels and 6,000 miles of sewers to use as their new home, the Judas breed create a sprawling colony and place their nests at the lowest and most central location. Egg sacs are laid in the surrounding areas at a slightly higher altitude, explaining how the local children were able to discover the infantile specimens. What's interesting is that, despite their seemingly male appearance when disguised as humans, the entirety of the soldier cast is made up of females. Due to the years of heightened evolution, all Judas breed females are able to lay eggs, left to be fertilized by the one and only king of the colony. The king of the colony is slightly larger than his lady counterparts. In contrast to the female stature, the male traverses in a more hunched fashion, using its elongated front legs for defense. Three years after the supposed end of the pandemic, Peter and Susan have gotten married and enjoy their life in New York City, steadily working on starting a family. However, a dark presence lurks in the city, leaving a trail of dead bodies in its wake. As Josh and Peter investigate a crime scene, Susan and her co-worker study a weird bug discovered in the subway by some local kids and end up making a startling discovery that the insects they engineered to die within six months had defied their design and persisted. Following a group discussion, the guys descend into the abandoned subway system to investigate, led by Charles S. Dutton's public transit officer Leonard. Arriving later to help with the search, Susan is abducted by the King of the Judas Breed, who carries her deep into the colony below. Following a fierce and bloody battle with the soldier variant, most of the team make it out alive and successfully destroy the species by blowing up their nest. At the same time, Susan is pursued by the King and is able to defeat him in the ultimate game of chicken. Returning to the surface with an insane story to tell, the group reflect on their choices and realize that this level of scientific meddling was a double-edged sword. Uh, a lot of people are going to the genre not because they're fascinated about the possibility of doing a fable with really strange images and rich uh, subtext or... Uh, I, I go into it because that's my chosen uh, form of communication. Commenting on the story and inspiration of Mimic, Guillermo del Toro remarked that the concept was very much a B-movie idea, as it revolved around a man-made creature that comes back to terrify its creators. Despite its basis in schlock cinema, the director attempted to heighten the experience by making it as A-movie as possible, with added attention to the art direction and set design. You love the genre and I don't... Yeah. And you didn't necessarily. No, but I have to but, admit that some of my favorite movies from the past happen to be standouts within the genre, like The Shining yeah. or Dead Ringers right. uh, or these movies that when they're done brilliantly, they have this incredibly effective quality where they, they just, you know, really stay in your mind and you carry them with you and they've got fantastic imagery. and. Although Mimic was released to critical acclaim, with many citing the film's evocative visuals and the director's blossoming signature style as major positives, the film was a box office failure. It was also another example of studio interference gone wrong, with even Guillermo himself stating that he was unhappy with the final release of the movie. Mimic was produced by Dimension Films and distributed by Miramax, and it wasn't long before they started to stick their heads into the creative process. After seeing some early test footage, Miramax boss Bob Weinstein was immediately dissatisfied, demanding that the film be scarier, like his brother. Whereas Guillermo saw an interesting tale of science and human hubris, Weinstein wanted a horror film that would fall in line with the studio's previous successes. The feud reached its climax with Weinstein attempting to fire Guillermo before being talked down by the cast. After the film was completed, Weinstein demanded control over the final cut, resulting in a finished product that betrayed the director's original vision. Luckily for us, with Del Toro reaching prominence in the years to come, nearly 14 years later, he was able to release a director's cut that added more scenes based around the science of the Judas breed, additional character building, and extra shots that helped flesh out the film's tone. Blending atmospheric dread with a classic monster movie vibe, complete with moody sets drenched in shadow, grotesque creatures, and spine-tingling body horror, the director's cut is a must-see for monster enthusiasts and lovers of Guillermo's body of work in general. Well, that's all for today, folks. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to hit like and subscribe to stay up to date on all my content. And uh, yeah, if you have any other suggestions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by.
Why are you asking me if I've ever seen some shit like this before? Do I look like I've seen some shit like this before? Hell no, I ain't never seen no shit like this before. Oh shit! What the? F you did, man. You see the size of that thing.